This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Cure podcast available every morning on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen. It's Wednesday the 17th of April here in London. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, the Fed's Jerome Powell concedes that rate cuts will need to be delayed. As Andrew Bailey signals, the Bank of England may be able to move before the US. The Chancellor Jeremy Hunt tells us lower borrowing costs could deliver a feel-good factor for UK voters as he hints at a possible autumn election. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell says policymakers will likely have to wait longer than previously anticipated to cut interest rates. His comments follow a series of surprisingly high inflation readings and jobs data that suggest the US economy remains resilient. Speaking during a panel discussion in Washington, Powell said rate setters need to see more evidence that the pace of price rises is cooling. So we've said at the FOMC that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2% before it would be appropriate to ease policy. You know, we took that cautious approach and uh, sought that greater confidence so as not to overreact to the string of low inflation readings that we had in the second half of last year. Powell's remarks represent a shift in his message after a third straight month in which a key measure of inflation exceeded forecasts. Policymakers narrowly penciled in three interest rate cuts in forecasts published last month, but investors are now betting on just one to two cuts this year. As for the Bank of England, Governor Andrew Bailey, he says that Britain is on a different inflation path to the US. The comments imply imply that the Bank of England might cut interest rates before the Fed. Bailey says US inflation is being led by demand. I think the dynamics of inflation are rather different between Europe, and I mean Europe geographically now, and, and the US. We're still seeing the extension of the process of you know, coming out of the big supply shocks that we had, the, you know, the impact of the war, the impact of coming out of COVID. Bailey was speaking at the IMF's spring meetings in Washington. In its latest economic outlook, the IMF predicted that AI could boost the size of the UK economy by 16% in its first 10 years of adoption, higher than most other countries. The Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says the prospect of interest rate cuts could lift the mood of voters and their view of the Conservatives ahead of a general election. He told Bloomberg the economy will be in a better place in the months ahead. Now that situation we were in 18 months ago with inflation at 11.1%, that is well and truly behind us. We think we have very strong growth prospects. So the feel-good factor as uh, interest rates start to come down, as people start to feel higher real disposable incomes, uh, will be stronger in people's minds uh, come the early autumn. Hunt's comments back up speculation that the government is planning to hold an election in the autumn. Markets are currently pricing in a first reduction in the Bank of England's five and a quarter percent rate in September. The ECB President Christine Lagarde has doubled down on the message that she gave last week that the bank is on a firm path to a first rate cut in June. She told CNBC on Tuesday that as long as shocks don't derail the slowdown in eurozone inflation, it'll be time to moderate the central bank's restrictive stance in reasonably short order. Lagarde wouldn't comment on how many cuts in borrowing costs are likely to materialise. Speaking in Washington, Lagarde also highlighted that the German economy may be starting to recover after being rocked by a series of shocks in recent years. Jamie Dimon has told Bloomberg that AI will transform banking, but it will also lead to job losses. The JP Morgan CEO's comments come after he devoted a chunk of his annual shareholder letter to the importance of artificial intelligence for the Wall Street giant's business and for society at large, likening its impact to that of the steam engine. Here's what Diamond told Emily Chang on the latest episode of The Circuit. But the way to think about it for us is every single process, so errors, trading, hedging, research, every app, every database, you're going to be applying AI. So it might be as a co-pilot. It might be to replace humans. Like, you know, AI is doing all the equity hedging for us for the most part. It's idea generation. It's large language models. It's note taking while you're talking to someone. And while it's taking notes, it may actually say to you that, you know, here's the thing of interest the client might be interested in. All error, all customer service. It's a little bit of everything. But it is going to replace some jobs. Of course, yeah. But I, I, look, folks, people have to take a deep breath, okay? Technology's always replaced jobs. Your children are going to live to 100 and not have cancer because of technology. And literally, they'll probably be working three and a half days a week. And you can watch the full interview with Jamie Diamond on the latest episode of The Circuit with Emily Chang on Bloomberg Originals, available on the app or YouTube or as a podcast. 
Now to some earnings. Growth is stalling below expectations at LVMH as consumers rein in spending on high-end goods. Organic growth at the company's biggest division, that is its fashion and leather goods unit, fell 16% compared to 2024. Bloomberg's Opinions luxury writer Andrea Felsted says that circumstances this year are very different. Now this time last year, first quarter of 2023, both of those were in the high teens. And they were about double what analysts expected. Now, we're up against very strong comparisons because this time last year, China was just reopening. The US was starting to slow, but it hadn't really turned down. So that was Bloomberg's Andrea Felstead speaking there. This is the slowest first quarter for the retailer since 2016, excluding the 2020 COVID period. LVMH's wine and spirits division struggled with organic revenue down 12%, while selective retailing performed the best, led by its beauty retailer, Sephora. To some breaking news this hour, the Dutch equipment maker ASML has reported first quarter bookings that missed expectations. The figure came in at 3.61 billion euros versus an expected 4.63 billion. Now, the company still sees its total net sales in 2024 to be similar to 2023. It's also expecting a stronger second half to this year than the first half. This as it confirms its midterm goals as it presented in 2020. 22. The United States is set to place sanctions on Iran's drone programme after the country's attack on Israel. According to the White House's National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, Washington is coordinating a comprehensive response alongside G7 countries. The US Secretary of State Janet Yellen says that the measures will come into play shortly. I fully expect that we will take additional sanctions action against Iran in the coming days. Um, We don't preview our sanctions tools, but in discussions I've had, um, all options to disrupt terrorist financing uh, of Iran continue to be on the table. Janet Yellen speaking there. The US will also announce sanctions against entities supporting the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Iran's Defence Ministry and expects allies to follow. Now, in a moment, we're going to dig into the world's top central bankers who have been uh, talking at the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington and the major changes we've seen as a result in markets. Plus, also we'll bring you Bloomberg's interview with the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. That in just a moment. But another story that caught our eye, have you seen all of the pictures? The torrential rain. It's not here in London, though. It's in Dubai. Yeah, perhaps unexpected this time of the year, but it's disrupted flights. Schools have been shut. Traffic's been brought to a standstill. In fact, the authorities in the UAE recommending people work from home today because it's been such uh, a disruption to the area. But this is after UAE authorities carried out a cloud seeding operation on Monday and Tuesday to help create or at least augment the rainfall that was in the clouds. And this is a practice they've been undertaking since 2002. They basically send planes into the clouds that implant chemicals and particles Uh, into the atmosphere to coax more rain from the clouds. It's meant to try and help with the water security issues Mm. in Dubai. Now they've actually, the media office actually in the Emirate dubbing the downpours rains of goodness despite the the fact that people's homes have been flooded. Yeah, I saw lots of images of luxury cars being stuck in enormous uh, sort of torrential rain. Uh, But yes, it's interesting though that it's it's actually more about kind of the weather and uh, yeah, I suppose the infrastructure to buy than anything else that it's in part man-made. Yeah, it's certainly very interesting to see the uh, effect that's having on particularly the airport in Dubai, which is still warning of some more disruption to come there too. OK, it's been a very busy week for central bankers attending the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington. The Fed's Jerome Powell is among them. He has signalled that policymakers will wait longer than previously thought before cutting interest rates. Bloomberg's TV anchor Kriti Gupta joins us now for more on this. Good to have you with us, Kriti. How significant a shift in language is this from Jerome Powell? This is a pretty big shift in language, uh, specifically when he's kind of admitting that the work isn't fully done on inflation. And this is in contrast to what he said in, in prior iterations, which is that progress is being made, that these kind of previous hot data prints that we've seen in January or in February in the States are perhaps one offs. It is, he loves to say, transitory, for example. So he's saying that this even uptick wasn't something to be concerned about 
until now. And this is where Lee, where you're starting to see the bond market really react. The comments where he specifically says that it's going to likely take longer for confidence on inflation. And that recent data shows that lack of further progress, as you mentioned, Caroline. This idea here simply that not only is the higher for longer regime still at play, but rate cuts are going to get uh, pushed out further and further. And you're already seeing that in the bond market, 466 on the U.S. 10-year this morning. Yeah, and indeed the two-year pushed above 5% briefly after these comments as well. I mean, how are markets taking this? Not well, clearly. And 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 one of the concerns here is less about the bond market, which we kind of have a forming consensus of in the last couple of weeks slash months, that 5% yields are probably going to arrive on at least the 10-year benchmark in the U.S. before coming back down to kind of below 4%. That was a big contrarian take uh, last quarter. This quarter, it seems to be what everyone is kind of growing around. The bigger concern is the ripple effects here, because remember, the FX market has been fairly sanguine. People are positioned long dollar. You haven't yet seen European currencies like the euro, like the pound, really crack. And the first kind of line of offense off this yield move and the ripple effect is showing up in Asian currencies where you're already having speakers come out from the BOJ, uh, from the Bank of Korea as well, really concerned about that currency story. Then you look at the stock market. Mm -hmm. Our 5% yield, not on the two-year, but on the 10-year, going to trigger some sort of sell-off in the broader stock market that accelerates the carnage you're already seeing. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, other central banks has, have also been speaking um, at these meetings and in a way sort of reacting. Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England suggesting that the UK could cut rates before the Fed. A vote of confidence may be that inflation in the UK and the trajectory here is different and, and more confident about it in Britain. It's a, a careful narrative to play with because and, and you can hear kind of the hesitancy in your voice as well. Uh, but But this the, the, the resilience in inflation can be viewed in two ways. One can be a result of supply chain shocks, which is not necessarily a healthy part of the economy. The other piece can be consumer resilience. A third piece can be structural issues within a given economy. You're seeing that in Germany, for example, where there is that persistent inflation, um, but some of the kind of tackling of it ends up meaning a weaker economic structure. It's a similar story right here in the UK, where you do start to see some of the kind of more sticky parts of the economy not being able to digest any sort of uh, persistently higher for longer story. So rate cuts can be insurance, the way that the US is kind of thinking about it, some sort of normalization of rates, or they can be a tool used to provide a little bit of cushion for average consumers. And it kind of feels like the UK is leaning towards the latter rather than the former. And that's why Andrew Bailey's comments should be marked as different than the Federal Reserve's as opposed to the BOE did a, a job well done. Okay, Kriti Gupta, thank you very much for joining us this morning with talking us through some of the central bank comments there happening at the IMF and World Bank spring meetings in Washington. Well, speaking of Washington, of course, we've got a big interview for you this morning. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, has told Bloomberg that interest rate cuts would lift voters' mood ahead of the general election. His comments add to speculation that the Prime Minister won't call a vote until the autumn. Jeremy Hunt has been speaking to Bloomberg's Kenny Lyons in Washington. I think the big message from today is that the IMF are saying that inflation is going to be 1.2% lower. Uh, there are people who are now forecasting inflation will be lower in the UK than in the US or possibly even the Eurozone. And so, you know, that situation we were in 18 months ago with inflation at 11.1%, that is well and truly behind us. And if you're looking forward in terms of longer term growth prospects, uh, the IMF today are saying that the UK will grow faster than France, Germany or Italy over the next six years. So we think we have very strong growth prospects. So you aren't concerned at all about what potentially could happen to parts of the UK economy, like the labor market, if policy were to take, stay too tight for too much longer, given what you are saying is a downward trajectory in inflation? Well, obviously, um, in the short term, we look to the Bank of England to get that fine judgment right. But what uh, finance ministers like me can do is much more about the longer term competitiveness of the UK economy. and. Uh, we note that the IMF today say there's a whole section about the impact of AI on the UK economy uh, because they recognise that London is now the world's second largest epicentre for AI R&D after San Francisco. Mm. And there's a huge amount happening in our tech economy, which is third only to uh, the US and China globally. And that is really where the, the big growth 
in the future is going to come in the UK, and that's where we think is makes it a very exciting bet for investors. Well, and your point is taken, Chancellor, that you oversee the fiscal side, not the monetary side. So on the fiscal side, you have suggested that an election could happen potentially as soon as October. Should we expect another potential fiscal event between now and then, or have we seen all we're going to see on that front before the votes are cast? Well, it's certainly the case that, um, you know, the feel-good factor is uh, interest rates start to come down as people start to feel higher real disposable incomes uh, will be stronger in people's minds uh, come the early autumn than it is now. People have been through a very bruising period. Uh, obviously, decisions about election timing are for the Prime Minister. And were we to have an October election, as I've said before, it would be possible to have a fiscal event in September. But we would decide uh, much nearer the time whether that was the right thing to do. Well, of course, you've already delivered a lot fiscally in terms of tax cuts, including personal tax cuts. And yet, when you look at polls, obviously, the Conservative Party is still running significantly behind Labour, I believe, by roughly 20 points. What else may need to be done on that front to convince UK voters to keep the Conservatives in power? What would you consider doing? Well, I'd be very cautious about looking at those polls because, um, first of all, as we can see from the challenges facing incumbent governments, not just in the UK, but in, in the US and sure. Germany, France, uh, the electorate have been through a really difficult period uh, with an energy shock, mm -hmm. uh, with high inflation, uh, with a pandemic. Um, but when it comes to a general election, it's a choice about the future. It's not a referendum on how you feel right now. And that becomes a very different uh, decision in people's minds. And we know in the UK that around a fifth of voters have not yet made up their mind who they're going to vote for. So we think there's all to play for. And what we're seeing now is much more positive data beginning to come through. Um, very good prospects for the UK going forward, as confirmed by the IMF today. And I think all that means that our strongest argument to the British people mm. is going to be that having turned that corner, uh, we don't want to take any risks going forward that would mean that we don't have that exciting economic growth. Well, something else the IMF warned about in its report today was around something you just mentioned, the idea of potentially an energy shock, considering we are still seeing hot wars, not just on the continent of Europe, but of course in the Middle East. We are waiting to see what kind of retaliation we might see from the Israelis after the Iranian attack over the weekend. How concerned are you about the way in which this conflict may escalate and the ramifications it could have not just for humanity, but for the economy? Well, I think we all have to be very concerned, but I think we should also take comfort from the fact that uh, the two biggest shocks that we've seen in the last few years, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the attack on Israel, have both been met by a very united response from Western allies, much more united than our opponents were expecting. And I think that what that demonstrates is that when the chips are down, we recognize the seriousness of the situation. We work together with our friends and allies, and the relationship between the UK and the US is right at the center of that Western response to the challenges we face. Given that there are these still ongoing conflicts, would you ever give consideration to raising defense spending, or is your focus really primarily on, on delivering tax cuts, and that has to factor in? Well, I think um, it's possible to do both because uh, tax cuts can help grow the economy. Mm. That means you have more resources for really important challenges like security. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, the UK recognises we're the biggest spender on defence in Europe. Uh, we recognise that going forward we're likely to have to spend more. But part of our job is also to persuade other NATO European countries that they need to spend uh, their uh, proper amount. Um, we can't just depend on the United States to defend Europe. We need to play our part. Well, we've heard certainly a great deal of that messaging in the U.S. as well, that where there has been a evolving conversation as for funding for Ukraine, certainly on Capitol Hill in Washington. It does seem that there will be a legislative effort now that could hit the floor this week that involves repo, the idea of taking seized Russian assets and using that to fund Ukraine's war effort. That's something the U.S. would like to pursue. Would you like to see the U.K. pursue that? Would you pursue? Uh, would you ask your colleagues that you were going to see at the IMF World Bank meetings down in Washington this week to congregate around that idea? Well, I think it's a very intriguing proposal. Um, I'll be meeting Secretary Yellen in the next couple of days, and I'll certainly be talking to her about it and getting some more detail on that. Um, but I think we should be thinking about anything we possibly can to come to the support of Ukraine. This is an absolutely existential battle 
uh, not just for Ukraine itself, but um, for a global order in which, uh, you know, since the Second World War, we have largely stopped large countries thinking they can just invade their neighbours and get away with it. And if we were to uh, let Russia get away with invading Ukraine, the ramifications would be huge, not just in Europe, but all over the world. So I think this is a proposal we should look at very carefully. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and